instead of talking about fold scope, which a lot of you have heard about, maybe in the very end I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, I thought I would talk about if I was you and somebody was coming, what I would have wanted them to tell me, right? Uh, and the point of that is very simple, uh, that when you do science, uh, there are all kinds of ideas you have in your head and you think this is what science is and this is not science and so I thought I'd write down some lessons, some lessons that took me long time to learn. And of course, they're very simple lessons. You will see them in your daily life. Some of them might feel too simple for you, but we'll go through those lessons. And then in the very end, maybe we'll do some demos depending on time. How much time do we have? You guys have had lunch? No? no. Okay, we'll try to make sure that we... We can continue up to around, say, uh, 1.15. Okay. One hour. One hour or so. Okay, maybe we'll try to do it faster. Your microphone is not working. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not. They're recording it. It's fine. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, so we don't need... Actually, you could take this away if you want, if it's interfering. Um, okay, lessons. Uh, here are a few lessons that I thought about. And we will go through them step at a time. This is an interactive session. Stop me at any point of time and we will go through these over and over again. Although they're very simple, at the very end there will be a quiz uh, where I'll ask you about these lessons. So, you know, you have to pay attention. Um, so the lesson number one is uh, how to make original observations. You know, you're all scientists and uh, we have to learn how to make observations. And sometimes uh, we think about science happens in a glass building somewhere far away with all the fancy equipment, anything you could ask for. Um, and that is not the case. Science happens in your kitchen. The science happens out right outside the garden. Biology is everywhere. If you care about life sciences, most likely for you to make an impactful discovery, you should have a footprint that's outside the lab and many of you spend a lot of time outside the lab. So I'll give you one example of something uh, that we discovered very recently that you will find so simple uh, that you could have done it too. Uh, and at that same time, we are all making these observations, but they're very profound in the end if you think deeply about it. So the observation or the demo I wanted to do is uh, I'm going to take some water here and uh, what you have to do is uh, take a drop of water, and most of you have played with water before, right? Uh, and I'm going to take this coaster, you can take any surface, and I put two drops right next to each other. So I just spilled some water here. Can you tell me what might be happening here? Unfortunately, you cannot see what I'm seeing here. It's just water. When water spills down, what happens? Okay, it might spread a little bit, that's interesting, that's good, but most of the time it doesn't do anything. When you spread, if I spill water here, somebody will have to come and mop it up and it, the water won't walk away on its own, right? Does that, does that make sense? We found something uh, in a kitchen where water started to walk away on its own and it was just water, so we got a little bit curious, it makes no sense. So I'm going to show you a quick video. Uh, what you're seeing right here is a glass slide, right here is a glass slide, and these are two drops of water, and I made them yellow by adding food coloring. Everybody knows what food coloring is? No? A little bit of color to it, and I'm going to now play the video and play close attention and tell me what's happening. What do you think is happening? right? Uh, it's just water, but somehow this drop here detected another drop on this side, started crawling over. So first of all, if you think about, uh, water doesn't just walk on its own, but it also figured out that it should be walking this way and not that way, right? So does that puzzle you at all? Does that make sense? You don't see that happening every day, but what, what is so special about this drop? So now to confuse you even more, 
Um, one of the puzzling things, and we worked four years trying to figure this out, was somehow these simple drops of water are talking to each other, as if they had a cell phone, and they could call the other drop and say, hey, you should come here. <laughs> and you know, we do that all the time, but what if simple materials can also do that? And we would like to tap into that signal and know how are these two things talking to each other, right? So to just give you a flavor, I'm going to skip some of this. I might come back to it. But let me just tell you, when you take something like this, uh, maybe I'll bring this a little bit close. And I'll just play a quick video. And this time, uh, I will talk less, but I just want you to appreciate what you're going to see on the screen. So you can make them run in circles. You can make them climb hills. So you have to think about energy now. You can have them marching like soldiers line up on their own. And uh, you can let them dance. But it's just water. So, something so simple, first of all, one of the things that ends up happening is when you see that, it's very beautiful. It sort of evokes these ideas of living cells crawling around, but as you all know, cells and many of these biological systems still are built of physical materials and physical parts. They can tell their friends, so you see, they know their own type. Did you see the red finds the red, the yellow finds the yellow? And this experiment is so simple that you could go home now, tonight, get some food coloring, get some water, clean up the glass slide by adding a little flame to it so it's clean, or just use a cover slip that's already clean, and you would see the same thing, right? But at that same time, as an observation, it was very profound because it, it's very puzzling. Uh, the four years were really trying to figure out the mechanism for how something so simple might work because it looks simple. There are lots of things in this world that look simple but have remarkable properties hidden in them. And this is what I meant by lesson number one, which is about observations. We only figured it out because somebody accidentally in the lab saw this. You know, we didn't predict it, but somebody was ready at that time to see something so simple and try to figure that out. So all of you are out in the field seeing all kinds of interactions, but if you just walk away from that, you'll never make a real discovery. So it's very valuable to pay close attention to your observations and develop a sense of being able to be looking out for these systems. Uh, to connect this to biology, because some of you do life sciences, I'll show you another movie. Uh, how many of you have seen any a movie like this? Uh, do you know what that, those things are? Can anybody tell me? Some of you do microscopy. How many of you do microscopy? One. How many of you have looked through a microscope before? How many of you have looked through a microscope twice? How many of you look through a microscope every day? So only a few, very few. And this is, you know, we'll talk about microscopes quite a lot. When you start looking through a microscope, you immediately identify all types of objects. This is a red blood cell. This is a white blood cell. And then there is a little bacteria right here. And what you're going to see is many of these cells do something really remarkable. Let's watch. You see what's happening? What do you think is happening? Watch this carefully. The bacteria is trying to run away. And the cell, who is going to win? Does anybody know? It will catch up and it caught it, right? So such a simple observation. But it's been 50, 60 years we've been trying to figure out how something like this works. And something like this is what keeps you alive. Because most of these neutrophils are killing the bacteria 
that are getting in in your streams. And if this doesn't happen, billions of time every minute, we might all just die because of bacterial infections. But one of the remarkable things about this and the observation that I just showed you, fundamentally they're really connected because somehow the bacteria is radiating some kind of a signal that this cell has the capacity to read just like the droplet and then find its GPS location and move towards it. Very much like what we saw in droplets. So sometimes you think non-living systems also show behavior that look very familiar to living systems and they're teaching you something and you take a lesson from that and then apply it back. So biology and physics are all the same. Biology, physics, chemistry, you know, you can't just say, oh, this is what I work on. If you're not paying attention to all the fields, you might miss out on something completely different. Okay, so that was lesson number one. Let's switch to any questions. Any questions before I move on? No question, so then I get to ask a quiz then, okay? All right, so let's move on to lesson number two. I'll skip this. Um, okay, importance of uh, stupidity. Uh, how many of you have heard this word before? Everybody knows what stupidity means? You know, we call your friend, oh, you're stupid, or it's said as a negative word, right? You say it, ah, you don't know how to do this, you must be stupid. Uh, there is an essay written by a, a famous scientist, Michael Schwartz. It's called Importance of Stupidity in Scientific Research. And it's very puzzling when you see a title like that. You say, wait a second, I am supposed to be smart. If I am a scientist, I'm supposed to be smart. I'm supposed to know everything. I'm supposed to be always right. And that's not the case, right? Nobody in this no room knows everything. Nobody in this whole planet knows everything. So it's very important to be humble about the fact that your whole life you'll try to keep learning and you always keep learning. Whether you're a PhD student, whether you're an undergrad, whether you're in high school, you're all the same. You're all students of nature. The nature tries to tell you something and the more number of try times you try to learn, it will come back to you and give you a few answers. So I'm going to give you my example of importance of stupidity where by making mistakes, you actually find something new, which is very interesting as an idea because if you want to be perfect and sometimes you're paying attention to your mistakes, you can learn something completely new. Uh, so this is a system uh, that we work on on an algae uh, and it's a cyanobacteria in this case uh, that we started with. Uh, of a cyanobacteria that makes bubbles inside uh, the, the cyanobacteria. And the bubbles are used to keep the position of this bacteria in the water column. So if you go to the Brahmaputra River, this thing might be floating around and when it comes daytime, it can rise up and when it comes nighttime, it could go down. So it could get the light. But it's a tiny little thing. How does it know how to go up and down? So we were trying to figure this out and I got some of these cultures, but instead of getting the right cultures, I ordered something completely wrong. And I was saying, ah, you know, as a scientist, I can't even get the right organisms to begin with. I was very mad at myself, and I put this bottle that I had got it on the shelf somewhere, and I forgot about it. For six months, I completely forgot about it. You know, I moved on to doing other things, and then six months later, I walked back, and I saw this is what had happened inside the bottle. So what you're seeing is the cyanobacteria started growing and on the surface of the bottle, it formed all these patterns. You know, it kind of looks like little galaxies and a banyan tree. There are all these vortex structures, these round little things. And I got curious about this, is why would something like this form a pattern like that? So, we mounted this under a microscope and I'm going to show you another video. Uh, and now this is a video of what's actually happening if you zoom in, the little green stuff that you saw are these tiny little single cyanobacteria and they do something really interesting. So let's play that video. Uh, how many of you have eaten noodles, right? This looks like noodles 
at small scale, but the noodles are alive. You know, they're crawling on each other. They are pushing and pulling each other and they slowly start organizing. So watch right here. There is a little pattern that's formed there and see how nicely they're organized. Although we just threw them on the slide, we didn't tell them how to organize. None of these individual filaments know what's going on around them, but suddenly all of them working together will form the types of patterns here. And the patterns are very much alive. They're movable, they're moving around, they're pushing and pulling each other. And what's fascinating about that pattern is a really puzzling phenomena, which is the structure that you saw in that corner is not made out of fixed parts, although the structure is fixed. So if I was to tell you, build me an Eiffel Tower out of bolts and nuts, everybody knows what the Eiffel Tower is? Or let's Kutub Minar or whatever you like, uh, out of bricks. But the bricks keep coming in and out of Kutub Minar, but the Kutub Minar still stands. That makes no sense. If you think about it, most of the time in structures that we make, this house was built with something, those bricks will remain a part of this house. What if those bricks keep coming in and out, although the house will still stand? In biology, there are lots and lots of structures like that that are called emergent structures, where the components of those structures will keep moving in and out although the actual structure will persist for long periods of time and one of those structures is a spindle for example. The spindle is a structure that divides chromosomes and separates them out and nobody understands how you can make a structure like that that has components that are coming in and out. And with that simple example what we got excited about was a capacity to ask that question by just watching all the parts. Many a times you're not able to watch those parts so it becomes difficult but here is an example where we could watch all those parts and ask how those structures form from individual components that are extremely motile. So this is a new field of physics and biology people call active fluids where there is a lot of activity and energy that's being transduced by these components and they start forming patterns and this is one of the fundamental phenomena of how patterns form in nature at least at the small scale. So this was another lesson in thinking about uh, stupidity um, and now we apply all kinds of theories to this. Uh, but the reason I wanted to mention this is you have to make mistakes. It's perfectly okay. You think you are trying to learn something. Something comes along and it excites you. You drop whatever you're learning. You move to the next thing because that's what excites you. And that's when you will really flourish. Is not to just say, I am supposed to know this, and then you go in that path, you like it or not, you keep going, that makes no sense to me. Once you make a discovery of your own, you start feeling, ah, you know, I have a vision in this space, so maybe I should be working in that space. And this is lesson number three, which I call, find your own taste in science. Uh, what does that mean, taste in science? So this is a lesson from another famous biologist uh, who has a paper uh, named Tim Mitchison. Uh, and the idea here is very, very simple, which is if you don't enjoy doing something, then you're not going to be the best in the world doing that. Does that make sense? Right? I mean, just like if you were a cricketer and you don't enjoy playing cricket, that would make no sense. So the same way, you have to find a field that you really care about. Uh, for me, uh, a couple of years ago, I got excited about mosquitoes. And I had no training on working with mosquitoes. I never knew how to grow any mosquitoes. Uh, we tried to grow them in the lab and we killed them for 10 times in a row. Every time we would grow, the, it, you know, you might think this is funny. Uh, growing mosquitoes is hard. You know, they go outside all the time, but when you want to work on research, it takes a long time and effort. You have to have all kinds of cultures. But I was interested in mosquitoes. And the reason I was interested in mosquitoes, as a kid, I was exposed to a lot of mosquitoes. I mean, most likely all of you are. Uh, 
But it's also a very fundamental thing to think about because I was looking for problems where there is a social connection to society and it's the single most dangerous animal on this planet. And how come we don't know everything about it? If I was to ask you right now, tell me exactly what species of mosquitoes are out here right now in your park, right? Uh, do you know the answer? Does anybody know what mosquitoes are flying around in this room at this very moment? Aedes, what else? Anopheles, what else? Culex, what else? How do you know? Did anybody sample this room? How do you know? Right? It's a very puzzling thing because we read about it. Because somebody came and told that Gohati had this mosquito here, right? This is the puzzle where you have to switch and ask yourself if it's causing all these diseases. Shouldn't I know myself? Did I ever catch this? And so I got curious about this. Uh, and one of the things that is challenging, it's a very difficult task, what I'm asking you. Mosquitoes are tiny, there are trillions of them, uh, and it would be very difficult for you to know all of them. There are many, many species. How many of you know, how many species of mosquitoes are out there? Does anybody want to make a guess? How many different types of mosquitoes are there? Let's throw a number. Let's. How many do you think might be there? We already counted three. It's okay to be wrong, right? That was lesson number one and two. So let's throw some numbers. I want to get, get a guess. 69, what else? 82, how many more? 3,000. There are roughly around 3,500 species of mosquitoes, just the mosquitoes itself, and not all of them cause disease. So it is a very difficult challenge to say, map the entire Gohati and tell me exactly what species of mosquitoes are rare. How would you do it? You would take a little net and you take one of our microscopes and you go out there and you can by microscopy you can immediately tell what species of mosquitoes it is right that's one way of doing it it would still take time so we started thinking about how could we do this faster and one of the things that ended up happening is this example which is uh, this very famous photograph does anybody recognize this man Ronald Ross yes he's the one who discovered that malaria is found and caused by mosquitoes. And how he did this hundreds of years ago is exactly how we still do this, which is, uh, this is a picture uh, from one of our field sites in Africa where we do a lot of work on mosquitoes. And I sit there and my colleagues sit there, we roll up our shirts and our pants and we sit and wait for mosquitoes to bite us and we catch them and you catch them at a time, you catch one at a time, you sit there from 6 p.m. to midnight or later because you have to catch the ones that bite mosquitoes. It's a very hard work and all you got is maybe 20, 30 mosquitoes a night and you keep doing that over and over again because only a few number of mosquitoes are carrying Japanese encephalitis or are carrying malaria because there are so many of them you still get transmission of diseases. So you have to catch a lot of mosquitoes before you would know. So it's a huge problem to think about how would you map this ecology without doing this manual labor. And this is the exact same technique that's used almost 100 years ago. Um, and again, we made a very, uh, very funny observation. So when I said that the cultures are dying, Hari is one of my students, uh, she's from Bangalore. She faced the same hatred for mosquitoes as I did, so I recruited her to work. And our colonies are dying, and she went and got some sugar water. Uh, there is this sweet dish called Jello. And we brought it to the lab, and we started feeding our mosquitoes on these sugars. And she noticed something really interesting. When a mosquito bites the brick of sugar, it leaves a tiny drop of saliva in the sugar. And that gave us an idea that you don't need to catch the mosquito. You make something 
that you let the mosquito bite and we collect a tiny, tiny, tiny sample. This is the exact sample that it would have injected in you when you got the disease. And then we can do all kinds of molecular assays on that tiny little volume to actually detect whether it was positive or negative. And just like the fold scope, we're going to start this as a project where we are going to introduce this tool. So I'm going to skip this because I'm running out of time, but I want to tell you what we are trying to do. So we're trying to make a little chip. And this chip pretends to be a human to a mosquito. So we fool him into biting this chip rather than biting you, but it leaves behind tiny, tiny samples. And in those samples are virus particles, there are parasites, you know, talk about pathogen discovery program. There are all kinds of new viruses that we are hoping to collect. And we're going to send these chips and cards out to people. You put it in your backyard for a week. You put it in a Ziploc bag. You ship it at a central place. And we are able to then potentially map in a global way how some of these vectors and the parasites are spreading. And it's very important because then when you see a hot spot in one corner of Guwahati, you say, let's get all the backpacks and let's get all the sprays and let's really kill it before it becomes an epidemic. Because the challenge right now is we are testing humans and it's already too late. Too many people are already sick before you're doing something about it. So anyway, this is another example. I wanted to talk about mosquitoes a little bit. And we started this project without having any backgrounds in mosquito entomology, but we had a taste. We really cared about this pr problem, and you land up with something uh, that is, uh, is fun to work with, and it's valuable to be really able to deploy at a larger scale. So this was another uh, lesson to remember. Uh, any questions uh, on this before I move on? So one thing about something like this is we can reduce the cost of this by orders of magnitude, which is really otherwise, if it was costly, you couldn't do it at a large scale. Uh, by working with very small samples, we can reduce the cost a lot. Um, OK, questions before the next lesson? Any questions so far at all? I will not let you go so easy at the end you will have to ask questions or we'll just keep sitting and waiting until people ask questions. So if you're already, if you're halfway through, uh, think about what you're going to ask me. Because if you don't ask me anything, I told you whatever I had to tell you, I go, I didn't get anything out of that. So I'm really hoping that you ask questions. So get ready. Um, okay, the next lesson is uh, frugal science. Um, and the way I describe frugal science is a very simple notion, which is there are two things. There is something called information, which is knowledge that you can gain by just reading and finding stuff out by reading. And there is something called experience. Information, because now internet is available, you can Google everything, you can find out. You could have Googled this and said, oh, there are 3,000 species of mosquitoes that are out there. But experience, so information is cheap, but experience is very expensive. Because you don't have sometimes the tools, you don't have scientific access, and you haven't experienced directly what it means to see so many species of mosquitoes and try to really make an identification yourself. So frugal science to us is a way where you could do, go back from information to experience, actually do it yourself. So when I said, did anybody sample this room themselves, that's what I mean by experience. You might find a new species of mosquitoes sitting at the very last seat in this lecture right now. Who knows, right? We don't know. And until you do this part, you cannot create new knowledge and you can read all the books you want. You won't really learn anything until you're spending time in the lab. I mean, tell me a veterinary scientist who has never touched an animal and read all the books in the world. Would he be a good veterinarian? Probably not, right? And this is a very crucial lesson, is every single thing you read, you have to say, how can I experience it? 
So I'll give you one example of what I mean by frugal science. And again, I forgot a little demo I was going to do. Uh, I am looking for a piece of tape. There it is. OK. Uh, so I have here, uh, I want to tell you what I mean by frugal science. Why do I call it science? I have a piece of tape here, right? It's a normal piece of tape, nothing special. And I am going to open it. Uh, and I'm going to do it a little fast, and I want you to pay close attention to the sound it's going to make. Okay, are you guys ready? You heard that sound? Yes. It's like a screech, and I could do it again. All these sounds that it's being made, when I peel it off, let's try it one more time. That sound, if I told you, is generating x-rays. This piece of scotch tape, such a mundane object that we all have, is generating an x-ray that you could use to actually make a machine that does x-rays. Everybody knows what an x-ray is, right? How many of you have broken a bone before? Oh, come on, somebody has broken a bone. How many of you went to the place and they said our x-ray machine isn't working? Come back tomorrow. Many places don't even have x-ray machines, right? So this is what I mean by frugal science. That, so this is not our work. This is a work by a physicist uh, in UCLA, but it was following up a work by a Russian scientist some time ago who wrote a paper saying that when you pull scotch tape, it generates x-rays. And then this is the image where you can see the light is coming where this is being peeled. And all these x-ray particles are being emitted from here. And they've made a machine that mechanically generates. This is just scotch tape. You put your finger and you put a chemical here. And after some time, you start seeing the x-ray image. And now, based on this discovery, they've just started a new company that is going to make portable x-ray sources. And one of the factors that you really have to remember, this is the big connection between basic science and applied science. Just follow your passion. If you love scotch tape, study it. It actually is not known why this works. How can adhesion give rise to a powerful x-ray source? So this is a lesson in frugal science that you can think about ideas that are not just the conventional way of thinking about it, not just making the same old, same old, uh, but actually change how you would ask that question. Um, why do we care about frugal science? Why think about cost? I don't have to tell you in this room. Most of the time when I'm working with students, I really have to explain it to them that there are 2 billion people in the world that live under poverty, $2.5 a day, and 1 billion of them are kids. If these kids are not going to be exposed to any science at all, there is no way we can have a fruitful world of the future. So it's very valuable. I mean, some of you have experienced this. The reason when we were planning a trip to India, we chose Northeast because we really felt there are all these remote parts of the country. And of course, people are well off in many of these remote places, but many services don't make it out there because it's remote. And so you really have to think about frugal science because that makes things portable. It makes it effective and you have the capacity to be doing science in remote places. So one lesson you really have to take is uh, there are ideas that you can take and apply in education. There are ideas that you can take and apply in healthcare. But then at that same time, you really have to start with a problem that you care about. And I'm going to probably skip this because I'm going to run out of time. Um, maybe I'll tell you about one problem. Um, We've been thinking about infectious diseases for a while. And uh, this is uh, some of our work. Uh, I took this picture uh, somewhere in Uganda. Uh, we're trying to figure out, of course, we're working on malaria. So this is a malaria endemic site. Uh, but we are also tracking mosquitoes at this site. And one of the things that you see when you go in many of these regions uh, is people live in huts, but right in the center, is a graveyard of their kids that were buried in their front. Why would you bury a kid right in the front? Because they don't want to forget this. And there are way too many of these 
There are more than 500,000 deaths every year just from one single disease. So talk about infectious diseases, something that we think we could cure if we had diagnostics has a huge impact on humanity. So that's a big, big, big problem. And then you add animal health to the same, which some of you do think about, that adds up to a very complex problem that we really have to tackle. And solutions have to go to these places rather than asking these people to come to a hospital in Guwahati. That's not going to work. Uh, so we started thinking about infectious diseases and one fun challenge that we had is we worked with several doctors in Uganda and Nigeria and one lesson that they told us you really have to think about diagnostics that could be done under a tree and I asked him you're really serious do, do we really have to do diagnostics under a tree so out in the middle of nowhere and then we went around and we saw these screenings and clinics that happen and this might be happening all around the country here itself uh, where you really have to screen patients where you have nothing no electricity no resources whatever you take with you is what you got to really actually do diagnostics so this is a problem that we started thinking about and uh, we chose microscopy because microscopy could be used uh, to diagnose many different diseases uh, so now, can anybody tell me who that is? Right? Uh, does anybody know uh, the history of this photograph? What is he doing? I mean, clearly he's seeing a microscope. Does anybody know? At least some of the microscopists in the room. Do you know Gandhi had some role to play in healthcare at that time? What was he working on? Do you know Gandhi's role in leprosy, leprosy eradication? Uh, so it's not clear what he's looking at. Uh, one story goes that he's trying to self-diagnose himself of malaria, uh, which would be very interesting. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I like this picture because it gives me the sense of uh, his appreciation for the tools. You know, this is a man that's not wearing any other clothes other than the ones he stitches, but he's still using a microscope because he understands the power of a tool when it comes into hand and he has no inhibition to a tool that actually empowers and helps his people. So this is one of the factors that we started thinking about what is the type of a tool we could make that could spread around and be used in by many, many, many people. So here is a quick uh, premiere of microscopy. If you play with microscopes, the last 200 to 300 years Microscopes have been changing. Um, one of my favorite microscopes is coming up. Uh, you'll see right there. That's a monkey sitting. And you'll see these are art pieces. This is almost craft. They're crafted so beautifully, so perfectly. And this is the evolution now our modern microscopes look like this. We started asking ourselves a question. If this is a type of microscope and I put this in a rainforest in Nagaland, how many days before it stops working? A couple days. And we actually saw these types of tools in Thailand and many other places. So these are research tools. It's great for your research. You should get all kinds of these tools right here on campus, do all kinds of science with it. But it's not a tool to just be put in a jungle and left alone to do diagnosis because it's not going to survive and people would not know how to use it well because they're scared of your scientific tool. You can never be scared of the tool that you work with, right? Imagine if I told you, if you're scared of breaking your bicycle, then you're never going to ride a bicycle, right? To ride a bicycle, you gotta get on it, you have to fall, it's going to get scratched. And this is the point of Foldscope, is you make a microscope that you work so hard that it will break it. And that's when you have learned something and you make it again and you edit it and you modify it. So that was the purpose of starting to think about these tools. Um, the microscope, some of, most of you were at the workshop, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. Let me just show you a couple different things uh, that you can do and what took some time to do. Uh, one of the ideas, uh, I'll just mention this briefly, is when we started working on this problem, this is the science part of this. It took us a long time to really figure out to mathematically understand how do you push the limits of what you can do with very little money? We told ourselves it has to cost a dollar or less and we went back to the drawing board and this is a connection between 
biology, and then mathematics. We had to work out 35 pages of math to figure out exactly the performance that we could get out of a tool and optimize it to a point where you could make a really good microscope. And this is this thing, if you never touched physics and you hated math, that's bad. Because there is no way for you to be working in a field and not knowing many other fields. If that's the case, you have to find a friend who loves physics and you teach him biology, he's going to teach you physics from scratch. Very important if you're going to make discoveries to forget about these fields, but just think of science. If I'm doing science, you will find a problem and you are stuck because you did not pay attention 20 years ago when the teacher was telling you how to solve this equation. And it's unfortunate and then you find your friends. You make friends and you teach each other. So this is another lesson. Um, let me skip some of the technical details here. This is what some of the images look like, the types of microscopes we make. We make some of them, we call them medical fold scopes because we're very focused on diseases. And we make some of them which we call educational fold scopes. They are almost the same, but we differentiate them because uh, we're careful about what tool should be used for disease diagnostics for humans. Uh, if some of you have seen, these are E. coli, this is bacillus, these are trypanosomes, that's giardia, most likely if you get traveler's diarrhea, that's from that. There is loa loa, there is filaria, that's schistosomiasis. So many diseases, and one of the things of the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years has been choosing a disease and then working on that specific pathogen and then we edit and modify the microscope to be very good for that specific disease because we would like to, for people to be able to do that diagnosis as quickly as possible. So I don't know if I have some examples of those diseases. There's also modifications. You can modify your fold scope to turn it into a dark field. This is fluorescence, that's bright field. And some of this we already did yesterday. Uh, I don't know if the IIT Guwahati professor is here. Uh, Okay, maybe she edited her microscope. We got some needles and we burned a hole in it to turn it into a reflected light microscope. You know, it costs a dollar. You edit, you make mistakes, you fix it back again, but suddenly you learn how a microscope actually works. So you cannot be afraid of modifying your microscopes. And if you go to the website and you register, there are hundreds of modifications that other people have posted. So then you could see how they did the modifications and you can follow them as well. So this is a diagnostic study that we just ran. Uh, this was done in Kenya. So this is a field site right here. It's a place called Ukundu and uh, Jim was working there for several weeks out here and it has a huge problem of schistosomiasis. And I was talking to somebody, I thought there is no schistosomiasis here, but I learned yesterday uh, from Professor Bora that there is some amount of schistosomiasis even around here. So we started mapping and essentially doing screenings for schools. We went from school to school and we would take urine samples from all the children and then we would sit there in their school and we had identification markers and then we found a significant portions of kids had schistosomiasis and then we treat them. It's very important to treat only after you diagnose. Does anybody know why? Why can't we just give drugs to all the kids? I mean, the drugs are expensive, so that's hard, but if they were cheap, yeah? <laughs> Side effects, drug resistance. If you do that, the parasites will figure out a way to completely avoid the drug, and now you're in a position where you have a disease with no available drug. That's very dangerous. That's starting to happen with malaria. This is the reason you need to do malaria diagnosis. So one of the fun things about this work was Jim actually worked with local people. So here is the team that he assembled when he got there. These are some local microscopists. Some of them were just friends of microscopists that he recruited. He trained them on the microscope and then he did diagnostics and we did a study to show that we could get 95% specificity with the samples that we were working with with urine. And this is what's required to test when you're looking, so these studies take a long time because you really have to do it on large number of samples. And this is what schistosomiasis looks like, but he also worked on stool samples, so he was looking at TT, a couple of other diseases, Ascaris eggs, 
These are very common problems that you see. Helminth infections are everywhere. And so this is one direction that this work is going, is to try to build a community that will now do large-scale screenings for diagnostics in a specific region. And that's where these tools come in handy because then we can distribute them at large scale, run training programs at large scale, and you have the capacity to build a workforce that is trained with a tool that's affordable to them, and then they can build up on that work and actually give the right drugs to the right people. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip this. And then the last lesson I want to talk about uh, is curiosity. And it has a title. Uh, I call it the amoeba in the room. Uh, has anybody heard the phrase, the elephant in the room? You know, we joke about. Um, and I'm trying to say, uh, it's interesting to think about the rhinos and the elephants and the deer and the stuff that you see every day. But there is a world out there that you don't see and notice. The amoebas and the ciliates and the algae, they are as complex. They have so much to teach us, as much as the big animals. And if you look at any ecosystem, they are a fundamental root of why something works. The health of a lake or health of a river is dependent on some of this microscopic life. But most of us, don't even know them. We cannot identify them. We have never seen them. And we have never seen them live by ourselves. And this is what I want to do. And the reason we chose this uh, as Northeast is the biodiversity that you have here is incredible. But nobody before has mapped this microscopic biodiversity. And nobody is going to come. No one person can come out here or a team can come and say, oh, this is what you have. You have to take ownership and say, I am going to go around and look at the ponds and share and discover. We have to do this as a community. So this is the big reason I, why we came as a team. We decided to come here. And the reason why we are here is because we're counting on you to join in in describing your own biodiversity. And one of the challenges to just remember why it's important is this is a tree of life for all eukaryotes. Everybody knows what a eukaryote is? Yeah? Animals and elephants and all animals combined are a tiny portion right here. Look at that. This is metazoans. Everything else is something completely different that most common people would never even register that it exists. It's completely undescribed. And there are so many more species that just in a couple of days, you might actually discover a completely new species, which is a very powerful thing because A, you made a discovery, but B, then you need to understand how it interacts with all these other animals that are at play. So this is uh, what I call uh, you taking ownership. The whole reason we did this workshop was not to just show you that we have a microscope that works. I mean. That's there. We've been shipping these microscopes around the world. We could have just shipped it to you. But that misses out on a fundamental thing, that the microscope is only one piece of the puzzle. The next puzzle is, what will you do with it? And we don't have to tell you that. You have to figure that out. You have to find your own passion. We will collect. Today, we were on Brahmaputra, and we sampled all kinds of things. And we found a couple of things that we cannot describe. But now, I can't come to Brahmaputra in the morning and get a sample. But you guys are here. And wouldn't it be fascinating if some of you got together and said every Sunday, just like we go to church or a temple, every Sunday 10 of us will go there to the coast, collect samples, do microscopy, and then two hours and you upload it to the website. And it starts creating this network of people around the world who are doing something like that. And this was just one example. You could choose anything you care about, but you have to take action. So everybody gets excited about when I give them a full scope. They don't realize I ask for something back. And what I'm asking from you back is a very simple thing, which is if you don't use it, it's a waste of my time, it's a waste of your time, and also you took it away from a kid who might actually have used it. And then secondly, what you are giving back is knowledge and experience to the broader community. So this is the most important thing. If you didn't hear anything, if you were sleeping, wake up now. This is the one thing you have to do. If you came to the workshop, I want to see 
something from you, your work, on the website. There is a big website that we made that allows us to share. Uh, we had to work pretty hard to actually manufacture these kits, but then when we made them in the lab, we started sharing them with people. And to give you a flavor, we ran a project in the Nagamboro National Park in Tanzania. These kids are Maasai kids. Maasai live completely open in the wild. These are 500 kids, we trained them. And the reason we trained them was they live right outside this window of the school. If you look outside, this is what you see. You see lions roaming around right there. And if you want to map parasites in lions, you better have access to lions. And you can have some scientists who would come in a couple of days, they work on it and walk back. But what if these kids actually took ownership of their own biodiversity? Very much like you, you are right here. And then maybe you will recruit a school in one of the closest uh, rainforests from here and train them and give them the tools and ask them to actually look at what's in their own surroundings. So this is very important to do. Otherwise, we will neither have these biodiversity hotspots remaining, neither we will know what many of these life forms do before they completely disappear from the planet. I mean, not only are elephants and rhinos disappearing, entire ecosystems are dis disappearing. There is a lot of knowledge hidden in that tree of life. You might make a discovery of a new gene in one of those species that would be critical for human health. There are all kinds of connections, but you have to start by sampling what is out there. So let me skip this. Uh, this is uh, the website that I was talking about. People make posts. So there are people around the world. This is Cape Verde, Africa. This is my own university. This is Bogota, Colombia. Tampa, Madagascar, right in Africa. This is a village in Honduras. There is, this is Cornell University. This is a tribal village in South India. One of the things, what is common about all those people and you is they have the exact same tool. They have the exact same object that you are holding. So when you make an observation and you do an experiment, any one of these people can repeat it. There are 50,000 of these tools now around the world and what we're trying to do is not just connect you to us, but connect you to this entire swamp of people. Because you might be talking to that kid in Tanzania and you would be comparing notes that, oh, do you have rhinos? The poop that I found, everybody knows what poop is, right? Yes? Here are all kinds of posts. This is a post from a kid in Panama. And he went out and he looked at all the butterflies but not only he took pictures of the butterflies, he looked at their wing structures and he made this beautiful map of all the wing structures and why these wings are different. And there are no maps of wing scales as broadly as he created right here in a couple of days. This is an example that I'll show you later. There are all kinds of these systems where you have to just get started and share it as a post on the website. Uh, this is the map of the world where all these tools are and within these couple of days you see the reason we came here was this was a blank. And so now immediately with all of you being there, if you count and you actually share, suddenly you brought northeast to this world map, right? And that's the point. And if you don't share, you go back home, you put the full scope on your you show it to your friend once or twice, then this remain, will remain dark. And that's what we're trying to do, is to light up these areas such that you have knowledge being shared across the planet. That's the most important thing. You can write posts in any language. If you speak English, that's great. But you can write posts in any language that you want, and we translate those into different languages to begin with. And this is a flavor of all kinds of posts that people have created. So this is a time to take your pen out and write down, this is the website, it's called microcosmos.foldscope.com. You have to register on it. And there are thousands and thousands of posts. If I, this keeps going forever. This is a video roll. With, and every one of these is somebody just like you. Some of the posts are very profound and deep and long. And some of them are just a short post and you get started. Somebody starts very small and then keeps going and within two months they become really, really good at it. But this is the notion and you know, this just still keeps going. I have to stop it at some point in time.
This is somebody looking at LEDs. Okay, I'm going to stop this. There are all kinds of instructions that are available. If you care about your community and you feel uh, there is a specific language that's non-English and that's not represented, if you would like to translate it, you can just send us an email and then we'll just send you the instruction set that you can translate in a local language. That would be valuable because then people who don't speak English will have access to a tool like this. And at that same time, uh, these are posts that, this is a post that I really like. It came out of India in the Western Ghats where one of the persons who's visiting Lax went out and he just traveled and he mapped out all kinds of pollen grains from plants in the Western Ghats and he ended up finding several different species which were invasive, which you have to think about because they're encroaching the forest in some way. And the post just looks like a few write-up that describes you. It has a map that shows where you are and it has, just has a few pictures. And it might be that you might not even know what it is. Many of the people who were on the river cruise today saw things that we didn't know what they are, but it's okay. There's somebody out there who might help you identifying it. So these posts are not supposed to be perfect. There's supposed to be a shared experience of where you are and what you know. So it's kind of like a lab notebook. It's instructions and you can edit them and you can improve them as you go on and become better. Okay, so I'm getting tired talking. I'm going to stop pretty soon. Maybe I'll show you a quick video which is a snapshot of the types of videos that I have taken around the world with my Foldscope in my pocket and we could do a quick demo of a Foldscope right after this. But let's just, I'll show you uh, this quick two videos. So anybody knows what that is? No? What do you think it might be? Look at that, something else is crawling and coming. Ice crystals, ice crystals don't walk, right? Maybe now because water walks, ice crystals might also walk. Anybody has seen diatoms alive before, right? Everybody knows what diatoms are? How many of you have seen a diatom by yourself? Only a few. One person has seen a diet. They are the most beautiful glass houses you will ever see. I mean, they're absolutely incredible. But when you see them live, they're not just a glass house. They have legs. They walk. They crawl. They interact. They bump into other things. And this is just a video that I took with my fold scope when I was right next to the ocean. I took a little. They are found in all kinds of ponds, all lakes. They're, you're surrounded by them. But nobody, none of you have seen it, which is the problem here, is the fact that you have to have that experience. It's okay if you've read about it, but it's very different than going after and actually seeing them. Okay, so I'll just share a quick video here of a couple of my posts, and I'm saying the same things in this video that I'm telling you, but because I'm getting tired of talking, I'll let the video do the talking. Can you hear at the back the sound? Yeah? You know, the world is struggling with big problems. We have challenges with biodiversity, climate change, health, hygiene, all these big problems. And it started looking at the root of it, actually half microscopic Microscopic things build everything. Fosco to me is a lens literally into that world. It is built out of origami, so it's a five sheet of paper. functional machinery that are even smaller than a dot that you write on a piece of paper. One time I was waiting for my train actually to come and this very, very, very tiny bug landed on the rim of my coffee mug. I wrapped it in one of my slides and 
I was absolutely shocked when this insect actually started laying eggs right inside the slime. The resources that were dedicated in that insect just for production for body is really everything. That teaches you something a little about why life is so resilient. It's just such an immense opportunity to come to this world and not know. It's not just for scientists to figure out how the world works. That is truly actually a passionate thing that we all start, but we all start by being curious about the world. We are born with this and we really need to culture this because fundamentally curiosity needs to be nurtured and kept alive forever. For people to truly believe in science, you have to share science directly with them. And that experience was really interesting for me. I felt Look, here is something that I'm trying to show you, and there is a sense that, huh, that's odd or awkward. Like, you wake up in the morning and you're walking in this garden doing science. You know, you don't have anything else to do. And we need to change that. So if I come back, you know, 50 years from now, and you walk around, and there are all kinds of people doing these things, although they have other jobs, it's perfectly okay, but they deserve a window into this world as well. So one of the other lessons is, if you have a fold scope, share it with your family. Teach your mom how to use it. Because we gave you that certificate. I don't know if how many of you get to see that. Uh, it's a micro certificate. So your certificate that you came to the workshop is microscopic. So when you will share it to your employer or your parents, they better know how to use it. And you better know how to use your fold scope. Otherwise, that means nothing. Uh, so you have to do this for me, is the fact that you really need to share this experience, not just keep it to yourself. Because that's again a waste of time and energy because you already are in a university, you have fantastic resources. It really clicks in when you go and start sharing this with other people. So I'll try this demo. Uh, we have, how many of you have actually seen Foldscope before? Can I have a show of hands? of? Okay, so maybe there is some crowd that has never seen anything with this. So I'll just do a quick demo to just show you. This is the tool uh, that many people build together. I just took a slide. There's a little light source at the back. I'm going to connect it right here. And I am already doing imaging at this point where I use it just with my eye. At this point, I'm looking at insect wings. And to just show you, I'll connect my phone to it so we can project it over there. Uh, and let's see, you know, live demos don't always work. So uh, we will give it a try though. Uh, and my microscope almost fell off the podium, but uh, let's try this. I'm going to put it right here. And does, do you see something on the screen? Perfect. Okay, so you're getting a live video from my phone here, and I'm just going to take it and I connect it. There's a little magnet in there that embeds right there. So now, can somebody tell me what this is? So that's a wing of a mosquito, and I'm walking around. I'm going to pan, of course. My power is out. But you know, just in those wing patterns, just looking at the vein structure, you can tell what species of mosquitoes it is. The way the wing pattern divides here gives you a complete mechanism to tell how. And then you look at the tarsi and the legs. And I'm going to now focus on this. Oh, right there. Do you see the tarsi? So this is just a quick example of the fact that eventually I didn't have to be here. Huh, that's interesting. OK, I should stop full scoping. We should talk. Uh, otherwise, I can spend all my time looking at this. Uh, OK, so I want to stop at this point, uh, thank uh, all the people, uh, especially DBT. It was a 
really interesting experience for us. When we were coming down here, uh, we had no idea uh, what, uh, what will happen. You know, many of us are not from the Northeast. Uh, we'd never experienced anything like this before. It was an absolutely fantastic time yesterday. You all work very hard, which I'm grateful for, but I'm also reminding you of the fact that science is about working hard. If you do this on a daily basis, you become experts, and that's really when you get to make your own discoveries. So here is a list of people who made this happen. Uh, a lot of people in the DBT team, uh, and we have a funding for more foundation to explore this and bring the tool to many other people.